We have our next speaker, Dr. Fennec, one of our transplant surgeons here. He's going to be talking about improving access to transplantation for the undo undocumented patient. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. This is an issue that uh, is unique to our community here in Brooklyn. We have a lot of undocumented patients, and they are uh, underinsured. They get emergency Medicaid insurance, which provides them in the state of New York access to dialysis but not to kidney transplantation. And as you've seen, kidney transplantation is a life-saving procedure. So first of all, what is the problem uh, nationally? We have 11 million undocumented immigrants in the US and their access to renal replacement therapy varies based on where they live. Most of them live in the state of California, then Texas, uh, Florida, New York, Illinois, as you can see over there. In states uh, in which uh, emergency Medicaid does not cover outpatient dialysis, um, dialysis can be uh, procured by acquiring private insurance or by utilizing uh, care at uh, safety net hospitals or through charity care. And what you can see here in this uh, map of the US is that many of the states actually do not provide even access to dialysis through emergency Medicaid. Again, the insurance that covers undocumented immigrants. Um, for example, in the great state of Texas, in order to get dialysis, you have to uh, become ill and uh, walk into the emergency department with a potassium of seven or with uh, severe shortness of breath in order to get dialysis, unless you are sitting on a fortune. Interestingly, uh, uh, I was surprised to find Connecticut, a uh, liberal-leaning uh, state, also on this list. And I guess that the liberal-leaning uh, nephrologists and surgeons there that uh, do transplant, their solution is to keep the patients in the hospital and uh, in order for them to get scheduled dialysis. Um, so access to kidney transplantation for this population is even more limited because there is no federal mandate to subsidize kidney transplantation. And uh, emergency Medicaid uh, provided by the state doesn't cover this treatment except for one state, Illinois, which had passed a law that allows undocumented immigrants that are already enrolled in uh, the state-funded dialysis program to receive state public aid funds to cover kidney transplantation. This is despite the fact that transplantation is more cost-effective form of renal replacement therapy. So you've already seen that transplantation is definite, definitely leads to better survival in uh, almost all patient populations. Um, but it, it's also much more uh, cost-effective. And you can see that uh, over here, the first year cost uh, for a transplant patient, the cost that is uh, incurred by the uh, insurance company is $89,939. Then the annual cost to maintain that patient is $16,043. Whereas the annual cost of maintaining someone on dialysis is $43,700. So you can see that the break-even point is around 2.7 years after the transplant. And this depends on what type of patient, what who's your recipient, mostly how much care are they going to require post-transplantation. And this graph, can move uh, farther to the left when you're dealing with a, a healthier patient, meaning th that the break-even point can be even earlier. After that, you're wasting money, basically by not transplanting a patient. Undocumented immigrants are people who are part of our community and they live here for many, many years. Uh, some of them live here for decades and they pay taxes, they donate their organs, and uh, our decision not to transplant them is not only, in my opinion, uh, unethical, but in every uh, financial uh, expert's opinion, also uh, uh, just not uh, uh, fiscally smart. So, so what, what did we do about it here at uh, Downstate? First of all, you know, when I started working here, uh, I was very quickly aware of the fact that our population 
is uh, significantly uh, underinsured. So as a first step that we did here is, uh, is uh, um, query the uh, Department of Health of New York State as to the numbers. We wanted to know how big is this phenomenon. So we submitted the Freedom of Information uh, Act from the Department of Health to find out how many people are accessing hemodialysis under emergency Medicaid. And we found that in the last decade, it's been around 2,500 people. And how many of them have actually been able to receive kidney transplant? A small minority of them, unfortunately, as you can see here. So we knew that we have a lot of work to do. And the uh, way that we handled it was, first of all, by learning about the pathway to obtaining state Medicaid, which allows you to get kidney transplantation for this population, dispersing that information among our own transplant center and then to the community, to you guys, to the dialysis centers, and partnering with an organization that in my view are saints, uh, which you see uh, one of the represent representatives over here, the senior advocate, uh, Karina Albustegoy Adler, who came to talk to us a little bit about how can it be done uh, legally in order to uh, obtain, um, first of all, the necessary uh, uh, status. It's not really a status, it's a legal category, and that's called PRUCOL. You're going to hear about that. And second of all, how to apply to state Medicaid and how this collaboration with New York Lawyers for Public Interest has benefited our patients and allowed us to transplant people who are undocumented. So without further ado, I wanna let uh, Karina uh, speak and tell you more about this process. Apologize, I'm a little sick. This is one of my favorite, oh, um, well, I'll start here. Karina Vistegui Adler from New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. I'm a senior advocate in our health justice program. Um, and I've been working for many years now to help undocumented folks get access to health to health insurance and in particular to organ transplants. Um, the majority of my clients are um, people who are undocumented and uninsured and are on dialysis and have been denied the access to organ transplants for many years. Um, the population does tend to be quite young or younger than the average person on dialysis, lots of young men in their 20s and 30s who end up on dialysis for a decade or more um, without access to transplants. So just a little bit about the organization. If you um, point your camera at that uh, dinosaur, you will get um, some information about our program as well. So this is the problem we were confronting, um, and this is the problem that Dr. Finnig um, sort of addressed earlier. Um, and actually, this is a paraphrasing of one of, of a quote from um, one of my favorite things that a doctor has ever said. Um, it actually is a paraphrasing of something Dr. Rashan said during our, our first meeting, um, which was, you know, this is a, a very unjust system if we can, um, if undocumented people can donate organs but cannot receive them, right? And so this is the issue we've been trying to address for a long time. Um, and this is this number that I'm quoting here, three percent of uh, deceased organ don donors are or about three percent um, are undocumented, and yet um, less than uh, one percent of them can actually move forward to receiving transplants. Um, that's a national uh, number. It's an estimate. Um, in some states, like uh, Illinois, California, New York, that number may be much higher because the population of undocumented people um, is, is higher. Um, in New York State, actually, uh, undocumented people can um, sign up to be organ donors and receive um, in New York City ID cards and uh, driver's licenses, which allows them to, um, to register as organ donors even though they would not get the benefit of that organ should they need it. 
Um, and just a little bit of information about the population we're talking about. Um, you know, in, in New York, we're talking about people who we call essential workers, right? People who make up huge populations in healthcare sector, food service, run our, our restaurants, um, get our food to our table in agriculture. Um, and, and we have a, a huge population. New York State actually has um, the fourth largest population of undocumented people um, out of the whole country. So again, just people in this community, people you know, they may be taking care of your elderly, they may be taking care of your children. And a bit of a case study to give you an example of some of the, the things that we do see. Um, I'm not going to read through this whole list, but essentially this is a client that I um, that we worked with, right, uh, who herself was um, uninsured and undocumented and believed that um, you know she was going to spend the rest of her life on receiving dialysis. And... When she came to us, she'd really lost hope. She thought that she was going to be on dialysis. She was going to die on dialysis and, and had no other way of, of really rejoining her community, rejoining her life. She she had a daughter, grandchildren, and, and you know, all of the dialysis schedule is, is grueling and, and she was not able to, to really participate in that, that life. Um, and so we were able to actually do an immigration screening and help her get access to health insurance. She already qualified and she did not know that. Um, so through this, through a program that I'll explain in a second, um, we were able to get her her health insurance. Unfortunately, her barriers didn't stop there. Um, because of misunderstandings and miseducation about um, the ability to transplant people like um, Mrs. G, we, you know, she was not able to initially get her appointment to even be evaluated um, for a transplant. And this was at another transplant center um, in the city that shall remain nameless. Um, and, you know, she disclosed that she didn't have a social security number. And after they'd already verified her insurance and after they'd already given her her initial appointment, they just summarily canceled that appointment. Um, she came to us crying, uh, very upset about the situation and was able to, um, I was able to help her get the the insurance and unfortunately the, the appointment. And unfortunately, as I was speaking to the administrators, the the you know financial service coordinators, the social workers, the you know the hospital administrators, there was a lot of um, evidence of people misunderstanding um, the law, misunderstanding um, the ability to to be able to transplant folks, um, and and who can get access to organs. Um, we were able to rectify that, and, and she's moving forward, thankfully, with her with her evaluation. Oh, the color's gone. Um, but this doesn't happen. Disenfranchisement has been of, of undocumented people. You know, doesn't happen in a vacuum. There's reasons why we, um, you know, why we don't, why people are not um, getting access to health insurance, and why they're they're sort of excluded from from programs like Medicaid or um, or even state funded. Um, you know, insurance programs. And it really, you can trace it back to even the very first law on immigration in the States, which was a law to exclude um, Asian Americans from entering the United States. Um, and all the way down to 1996, when there was a huge reform in the immigration system um, that really penalized people for entering the United States um, without permission and then remaining. Um, it also limited the um, benefits that people could apply for, including Medicaid. So how are we addressing this problem? Um, we're we're sort of taking a multi-prong approach in LP. Um, one of them is um, getting insurance for people. Um, there are several categories of um, health insurance eligibility that people who are considered undocumented may fall under and may give them access to state-funded Medicaid or the essential plan, which is the um, ACA marketplace plans in New York State. Um, and the one that we focus on really is Prucol um, because it's the one that we see the most people um, benefit from. Um, we're working on pipelines, one very important pipeline with SUNY Downstate that has been, you know, incredibly fruitful. Thank you. Thanks to their outreach to us directly. Um, education of um, medical providers, people who are interacting with undocumented people in dialysis, as well as doing systemic work to um, you know, change the laws that are in place that are preventing people from really accessing the care. So, you know, the this the this should say Prucol right at the top, but it doesn't. Um, so, what is Prucol, right? So, Prucol is um, is not an immigration status; it's a healthcare eligibility category, um, and it's specific to New York State's 
Um, there are other states in, in the United States that have pre-call legislations or pre-call um, regulations on the books, um, but the pre-call um, qualification status doesn't transfer for state to state. So if somebody is pre-call in New York, they may not be pre-call in Massachusetts or California, where they also have these regulations on the on the books. But what it does is really it just opens access to state funded Medicaid and in New York, the essential plans, which are some of the, the ACA plans, as I mentioned. Um, these are means tested public med benefits, meaning there is a rigorous process for people to enroll. Um, and I, I like to emphasize that because some of the, the misunderstanding that I that I hear a lot when I'm speaking to providers is, um, you know, uh, I think uh, about whether people are gaming the system to gain insurance. It's, it's really not possible to do that because it's it's a rigorous process to even get enrolled. The state has to look at all of the documentation and decide whether you do um, or do not qualify. Um, and the way that somebody is considered pre call, the elements in the regulation um, is a federal agency knows that the individual is present, uh, permits or acquiesces to the individual's presence, and the agency is not contemplating deportation. And so those are all sort of like immigration terms that we, we navigate for our clients to be able to get them enrolled in their health insurance. And there's a few ways that we can do the, the enrollment. Um, in addition, they'll, they'll meet the, the New York uh, State residency requirements. Um, and so there's a few ways that somebody might be considered for call, right? Um, they might have an immigration application that's been filed and is pending. Um, and that can be a number, you know, a lot of the, the ones that people are familiar with are, are things like having a family member who is sponsoring them, who is petitioning for them. Um, but there are lots of other uh, applications or parts of applications that'll make somebody crew call for the purposes of enrolling in health insurance. Um, an immigration application that's been granted, but maybe they haven't received their um, work permit or their visa, as long as we have um, conf confirmation that it's been granted, we, we can get them enrolled. Um, people may be familiar with the term DACA, um, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Even though that program has been suspended, people who had been DACA or considered DACA can renew, and they are considered, um, you know, pre call for the purpose of health insurance eligibility. Um, people who are who were detained when they entered um, and are released with an order of supervision, we call that an OSIP, or have a humanitarian parole, we are able to um, go ahead and get them insured. Um, and then we also can, in certain cases, argue um, that they meet the, the qualification for somebody who is considered proof call. And we do that, um, you know, one of the ways we do that is through a, um, med a deferred action that we call medical deferred action. So, um, lots of ways that um, people may not be so familiar. I think there's a lot of emphasis on trying to find a, uh, a legal pathway for somebody to become a legal permanent resident, but all of these other options are available to people and does make them um, eligible for health insurance. Um, and so this is our, our pipeline, right? Um, this is the collaboration that we've had uh, with SUNY, which has been really uh, a wonderful um, boon to our clients, and I hope also for, for the, the SUNY program, um, which really starts with the SUNY coordinators. Um, the coordinators do outreach at the dialysis center, so you may have, you may have seen them around. Uh, they may be giving flyers. They may be talking to you about um, health insurance. Um, they refer the clients directly to us. We will do a a full immigration and benefits screening. A lot of the time, actually, we find that patients are already uh, qualified for health insurance, just didn't know that they were. And so if that's the case, we send them directly to be enrolled. Um, and if not, in many cases, we do take on their representation and help them um, either file applications or find documentations from old applications um, to be able to get them enrolled. Once they're enrolled, um, we uh, refer them back to SUNY where they uh, hopefully start their, um, you know, you know, medical evaluation to, to move forward with their transplant. And we've had um, several, several clients and patients who, have, you know, done that loop and are, are happily moving forward to, to finally get their transplants. Um, and so the rest of this, I think that the doctors are, are better able to speak to, but essentially they'll get their um, insurance verified to make sure that they, um, you know, they'll, they'll get covered for all of the pre-transplant evaluation. Um, and then they'll, they'll have their medical determination of whether they do qualify for a transplant, hopefully get listed, and then hopefully move on to transplant. So um, we, we've had, uh, I think now, 
that we can account for um, two people um, who are listed and at least one person who's gotten their, their transplant. Um, and frankly, in the five years that I've, that I've been doing this specific work, that's more people than I've seen in one year um, sort of move forward in the process. So really excited to see, see this moving forward. Um, and then the last thing that we do is really education. And so I mentioned some of the barriers that I that some of our clients do face. Um, a lot of that is lack, lack of knowledge from the, um, the community, the medical community, the financial service coordinators, the social workers who may not be aware of call and all of the ways that somebody can be considered proof call in order to qualify for health insurance. Um, and so, you know, something, some of the things that we see come up a lot is requiring social security numbers. Not everybody can get a social security number only people who are legal permanent hmm. only certain uh, categories of, of immigrants are, are going to be able to get social security numbers but that doesn't mean that they can't get health insurance um, and so requiring a social security number for an appointment which we do see if you call up some of the the local transplant centers the first thing they're going to ask you for is your name your date of birth and your social security number and if you don't have those three things they're gonna you know tell you to call back when you have them um, asking about immigration status um, when they maybe are not trained to understand all of the immigration statuses that would allow somebody to get health insurance, um, not having interpreters or uh, language access um, readily available for our clients, including websites that are not translated into the major um, languages used in the city. Um, and materials that are given to people, um, such as, you know, appointments, instructions that are not in their preferred language. And then there's there's sort of this this idea of this bias that maybe we're unconscious or conscious about um, you know who is a good candidate to move forward in transplant. Um, and what we see sort of anecdotally from our clients in in the many years that we've done this is that there's a a really extreme focus on their immigration status and whether they they will continue to be able to have health insurance. Even though they have the health insurance, there's no reason to believe that they will not have the health insurance anymore. Um, and so it's a lot of educating of people, of, of people in the community to, to understand that, um, you know, New York State is, it has all of these regulations in place to help people move through these processes. Um, there's questioning. I've, I've, heard, I've been in meetings where they're questioning the immigration status of the caregivers who's going to take care of this person post-transplant. Um, are they also undocumented, meaning are they going to get deported any day soon, right? Who's going to be the person? What they don't realize is that over half of the, the, the families in, in the country are mixed status families. So they may have already transplanted somebody whose family member was undocumented and was providing the, the great care. Um, they, the secondary eligibility check. So um, somebody may be able to get their initial appointment, have their insurance verified. And then once they realize they don't have a social security number or, you know, often they notice that they have an essential plan. And so that sort of triggers a flag to be like, are these people actually qualified? Um, and so they'll start asking for immigration documents, um, which is, um, you know, I think a strange thing to do when you wouldn't ask for something like that from, a, from another uh, potential uh, candidate. Um, and the other thing is these pro call letters, you may have heard from other organizations that they provide pro call letters saying this person is pro call, therefore they qualify for health insurance. Um, and so that's another form of bias that we see because not all immigration practitioners understand pro call, even if they were able to help with, with some sort of immigration process. Um, and not all people actually have access to immigration practitioners who would be able to, to talk about pro call or be able to um, help them through that pro call process. So um, we're Requesting that is really creating a barrier. Um, and then, of course, commentary about mythology, about whether these people are, are going to be, you know, leaving the country immediately, about whether um, the outcomes are going to be the same. I think that that sort of uh, steps into the realm of, of not evidence-based. Um, and here's sort of the last thing that we're doing. This is more of our systemic approach, right? Um, coverage for all. Um, Maybe you heard about it, maybe you haven't. This is actually a, a legislation that, that we're trying to pass this year. Um, there's an active campaign to get it into the state budget. 
which would allow all people, regardless of immigration status, who meet the income eligibility requirements to enroll in Medicaid. Um, so that's a big push to get everybody the health insurance that they deserve. Um, the other the other thing we're trying to work on is a, a Medicaid expansion through a waiver. Um, the state of Colorado has actually recently, I think within the past year, actually passed a similar waiver that allows undocumented people to enroll in Medicaid. So it's possible. We just need to have the, the political will uh, to do this. Um, the other thing that we're working on is also the expansion of emergency Medicaid. Um, as Dr. Finnick mentioned before, emergency Medicaid will cover dialysis, but it will not cover an organ transplant. So another push that we're doing as an interim step, if we can't get everybody covered, is to get emergency Medicaid to cover transplant care and post-op care um, for people who are able to get their transplant. And then, of course, we do lobbying, funding, um, and other public services, including having these strategic partnerships and education for people. So that's it. That's me. Um, I'll go ahead and sit down.